that's what I figured I'd go over with you guys today is just pulling out price because I feel like that's like the biggest thing that people have difficulties with is getting the price out of somebody and knowing when to make the first offer, different things like that. So yeah, that's basically what I'm going to show you guys today. Sounds great, man. That's always a pain point that investors have is negotiating with sellers. So I think it's a perfect topic to talk about. All right, guys. So um, I've done one call before, but I don't see a whole lot of new people. The only person I really know here is Tardas because he's my business partner down in Florida. So, but anyways, if you guys don't know me, so uh, I invest in real estate, been investing in real estate since 2018. So it's been about six years now. Um, own a bunch of properties up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. My business partner and I up there, we own somewhere around 80 rentals. Um, we have a flipping and wholesaling business. Uh, that we've been operating now since 2018 as well. Uh, we probably have about 15 people. We buy somewhere between 20 and 25 properties a month now. So really ramped it up. I think we bought a 260 something last year. Or so anyway, we have a lot of experience in sales. My background is also in car sales. So I was in car sales for about six years. Um, got sales first of the year for about four years in a row on when I was in car sales as well. So yeah, most of my background is all in sales. And then I took basically what I learned from car sales, translated it over into real estate. And uh, yeah, it just, it started going really, really well from there on out. So I learned a lot about amortization schedules, just loans, stuff like that, but then also learn about negotiating with people. So that's what I figured I'd go over with you guys today is just pulling out price because I feel like that's like the biggest thing that people have difficulties with is getting the price out of somebody and knowing when to make the first offer, different things like that. So yeah, that's basically what I'm gonna show you guys today. Yeah, sounds great, man. That's always a, a pain point that investors have is negotiating with sellers. So I think it's a perfect topic to talk about. I like it. And then the other thing too that I forgot to mention is also I do sales training for Ryan Pineda's program too. So if you guys have heard of Ryan Pineda, I do sales training for him as well. All right, so I'm gonna send you guys this right now so you guys can have a copy of it. So um, who in here, I wish you guys had, I wish you guys did have your cameras on because it makes me feel like I'm actually with you guys. But who in here, you can raise your virtual hand if you want, is uh, sending out active marketing to off-market sellers right now to where you're actually taking the calls. So who's who's marketing? Taras, Sherrod is. Is anybody else marketing outbound? Just outbound or outbound, inbound? Okay. Cause yeah, what I was going to show you guys is like basically like an inbound script or an outbound script. Outbound is usually a little bit more difficult, but I'll go over, I'll go over basically the differences with you guys real quick. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to go over just step one to step two really quickly. Cause Sherrod, I know you've seen this before. And if there's anybody else that was on the last call, maybe like a year ago, I don't want to show you guys all the same stuff. So I want to show you guys specifically for pulling out the price, because I feel like that's where the biggest issue is. Now, the funniest part is I also think that it's like, not the most important thing. I think it's way more important to build rapport with the person, find out their pain points and really help see if you can help uh, um, with their problem that they're trying to solve. So basically, whenever we get a lead, we're trying to qualify or disqualify. Those are our goals is to find out, is this a deal or is it not a deal? So we don't have to continue to follow up with them. That's kind of the goal of the entire call. Is this person supposed to list with a real estate agent? Are they going to stay in the house forever or are we the right people to sell it for a cash offer? So that's kind of our goal whenever we're talking to these people. But again, I think that most people struggle when they get to the price. So I want to focus on that. But anyway, this is how a general call will go. So they call in, hey, I saw your, uh, I got your letter in the mail, it says you want to buy my house. How much are you going to offer me for it? Um, well, awesome. Were you interested in selling that property? You want them to say yes right in the beginning. Uh, because a lot of times it's going to be like, well, you sent me the letter. So I just want to see what you're offer. Okay. Awesome. If I was able to offer you the right price, you would consider selling it then. Like you want to get that yes, right up front. Otherwise it's usually more difficult to get later in the call because most of the time, all they want to do is they just want to get your offer and then they want to get off the phone. Right? So if you give them an offer, yeah, we we're very interested in it. Um, we'd offer this. They'd be like, yeah, that's a low ball and they'll hang up on you. Um, so the whole point of getting them on the call and actually asking this stuff is because your leverage is your offer. So you really want to wait and see if you're a right fit for them before you give them that. So anyway, uh, a lot of times we ask them, what's the address? Sometimes people get upset about that too. If it was a letter or something like that, they're like, well, you sent me a letter. Don't you you know, have my address? 
And of course, like, you know, what we say is we send out multiple letters to properties. We want them to sound specific, like we did target theirs. So we say, hey, yeah, we do send out a couple different letters to properties that are close to ones that we already own or ones that we're very interested in. So I did send out a couple of them. It helped me out if you just gave me your specific address. And then that's an easier way to like kind of get it without being confrontational. So anyway, these are the different ways that it could go. Most of the time, if they're calling you, they're going to tell you to take them off the list or they're going to actually be interested in selling. These are the different options. I'm not going to go over all of them. You guys can read through it. This is where you're going to spend the majority of your time. Okay. So this should take somewhere around, I don't know, between seven and 10 minutes is where you're going to spend most of your time right here. Finding out about the property building rapport with them. I always start off with a very open-ended question. Hey, what's the situation with the property? That way, hopefully they're going to tell me everything, their motivation, their timeline, uh, the repairs that it needs, you know, the price that they want. They might say all of it all in one if you just let them talk. So I ask an open-ended question up front. Um, if they don't really answer that, like, well, what do you mean? What's the situation? Like, are you living there? Is it vacant? Is it rented? You know, I ask different questions like that just to get, again, try to get them to talk. If they're being very short, that's when you go into the repairs. You always build rapport with the repairs up front because it makes logical sense of why you're asking um, them for the repairs. If you just start asking them, well, why do you want to sell all this other stuff about personal? They're like, dude, what do you need to know all that for? That's my business, you know? So if you start asking non-logical questions, you can get more confrontational because if they say, hey, what repairs are needed? Like, well, why do you need to know that? Well, uh, it's going to depend on my offer that I'm able to offer you because if I don't know how much repairs it needs, I'm going to have to assume the worst. And so then again, it makes logical sense of why you're asking that. I highlighted the questions that I think are must. These are not in order, but it's just like a questions that I think are important. So again, what's your ideal situation that you're wanting to do if we're able to offer you the right price? This is future basing. Like, hey, where are you trying to go with your life? What are you trying to accomplish? What's your next steps? Those are all future pacing to help figure out what they're wanting to do. This is a question I like to always ask. Are you looking for the highest price or the simplest process? Most of the time they say both. Um, and then we break it down and say, hey, in order to get the most, you know, you're going to want to clean it up, make sure it's vacant at closing, get professional photos. You're going to pay realtor fees, appraisals, inspection, closing costs, um, simplest process. If you're looking more for the simplest process, that's what we can actually help with. It'll be cash as is which means there's no realtor fees, commissions, appraisals, no inspections other than our one-time walkthrough. This is, can all be made up depending on your guys' process too. Um, we have it to where you can take or leave whatever you want and we're gonna close whatever works best for you. Now, this is something that I just added that I really like to do is out of those two options, which one sounds like more of what you're looking for? And if whichever way they say, so if they're like, well, I think the real estate agent way, I think I wanna go professional. Okay, and why do you feel that way though? Well, because I want to get the most money and then cool. Now, you know, and then now you're going to push them that way. If they go the other way and they say, oh, I think I want the easier, more simple process. Well, why do you feel that way though? Well, because I don't want to clean it up. It's cash as is like they're basically telling you all the things that are very important to them. And then by them verbalizing it, they're basically selling themselves on working with you. So that's the reason why we ask that there whenever they say, you know, both. These are different questions that you can ask. Is there a balance we'd need to pay off? That's kind of up to you. If they say, hey, my next steps are I really want to get into a new house and I need $20,000 down. That's when I'd ask that question. Oh, gotcha. So you need $20,000 down. Is there a balance that we'd need to pay off on this one? You know, there is, but you want to get the actual answer without being confrontational. Um, and then this is something that we go over if we tell them a little bit about our company. Again, we ask this, why do you feel that way though? Whenever we're basically going over the benefits of working with us, we want them to say it out loud. After all of this, these are other questions actually before I go on to the last step that I want to talk to you guys mostly about is these are different past questions that should be kind of inside of the conversation while you're talking to them. This is going to be like, um, if somebody's like, well, I want $20,000 for the down payment uh, for the next one. Gotcha. You could say something like, well, why is that important to you? Or why that number specifically? Well, I was thinking I wanted at least, you know, 10% down. And so I was looking at a couple hundred thousand dollars house and you know what I mean? Like they'll explain to you why that numbers uh, specifically, or why are you considering selling now? Because a lot of times they'll say, I've been receiving letters for years. You guys sent me so many of them. Oh, gotcha. Well, why are you considering selling now? Like now they're going to go into it more and tell you more about specifically why now. Um, you know, you can go into past behaviors. Well, what have you tried so far? Oh, nothing. You're the first person I called. Gotcha. Well, how long have you been thinking about selling for? 
now like all of this stuff is is to help them understand their situation for you to understand their situation and then also have sufficient ammo we call it in order to help them make a decision because our goal is to get them to make a decision i always tell our sales guys our goal is not to close every deal you're not going to close every single one our goal is to help them get from where they are to where they want to go whether that's staying in the home selling to on the market with a real estate agent or selling to us like that's my goal is to help them make a decision by asking good questions so this again this is the most important part but this is where i feel like you know a lot of people are like yeah 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 i'll build rapport i know all of that and then they have a lot of questions on the pricing so that's where i want to spend the majority of our time today is on this pricing but i have to preface it by all of the other stuff is more important than this pricing, in my opinion. It's way more important to find out if they're even right to work with us or not. Um, and you're gonna find that out by asking all those other questions. But this is my process for getting uh, the pricing over the phone. So first, I always try to get the price. I just say, well, how much were you hoping for? Um, after I get the number, then I'm gonna ask, okay, so here's what you're hoping for. If I was able to offer you cash and close quickly, what would be like the lowest you'd be willing to accept? And you notice my tonality, I kind of change it there too. Like if I was able to offer you cash and sometimes you might not use the word quickly as well, but if I was able to offer you cash and close whenever's convenient for you, what would be the lowest you're willing to accept? And then if we ask that, then we can also ask the follow-up question. So if I'm unable to offer you $100,000, should I not even come out and tell you what I can do? And then you can see how firm they are in that number. So that's the first steps if they're actually going to give you pricing. Um, another way is if you built a lot of rapport, and I've seen RJ Bates and other people use this one. I actually like it a lot. Well, what's the best price you could do for me? And like, it sounds weird, but like, if you just say something like, what's the best price you can do for me? If you built a lot of rapport and like make them laugh and actually get them to like you, you can ask questions like that. And then they'll actually go lower. Or if like, you feel like you built a lot of relationship with them, I'll just straight up ask them that. Like, hey, what can you do for me personally? All right, the other way. So this happens more often than not because everybody learns that, hey, you don't throw out the first number, right? Whoever throws out the first number loses. That's what most people say. So this is a way that I found to do it. It is, it is a little bit tricky, um, but this is how we do it. So, hey, this is not our offer. But it looks like other investors are paying around like seventy-five to eighty thousand. And again, that's not our offer. But if another investor were to offer you that, what what would you say? And most of the time, they're like, "No, no way, I would never do that." Okay, I, I completely understand. A lot of times, we're able to pay a little bit more than other investors. And I think I got that here, right here. A lot of times, we're able to pay a little bit more than other investors. How much were you hoping for? And now that you threw out a number they're way more likely to throw out their number. I gave a, a different options too. You can say, okay, no worries. How much were you hoping for? I understand we're just going based on the estimated repairs that you said needed to be done. You know, how much were you hoping to get for it? Because again, once you say a number, they're that much more likely to say a number. But the other thing that I would say is this number needs to be so low. It needs to be a low ball that where if they say yes, it's so crazy low. So what we usually do is I wrote it right here. This number is to flush out what they want. So it should be a low ball of 50% of Zillow or Realtor. And then sometimes I even subtract out some repairs. Like it should be a crazy low ball. The way if they say yes, it's a steal of a deal because it's again, it's not an actual offer. That's the weirdest part is in our minds, we feel like we're giving them an offer. We're not, we're saying other investors offer this and then it gets them to say a price. And now we can actually see if they're in the range. One last thing that I want to say on this is sometimes I say, well, how much are you hoping for your property? I want to give you guys an actual like real life example. Let's just say the ARV is actually $200,000. And then they're telling me it needs paint, flooring, a new roof and all this stuff. And I think that that's going to be a $40,000 rehab. And then they say, yeah, I want 180 for it, right? So I'll say, well, how much were you hoping for your property? Uh, I want 180. I'm like, okay. I mean, uh, if I was able to offer you cash and close quickly, like what would be the lowest you'd be willing to accept? And they're like, uh... I mean, the lowest I, I do is 178. I would then go to step number two and I would just act as if they didn't even give me a number because we're not even in the range at that point. I'd say, hey, look, this is not our offer, but it looks like other investors are paying somewhere around 100 to 105. I mean, what would you say if another investor were to offer you that? And then they're gonna be like, no freaking way. I'm like, gotcha, I'm just running based on your numbers. I mean, 
like what, what again, like what will be the lowest that would make sense for you? Or like, what could you do for me? And I'm going to see if it's even in the ballpark at that point. If they still say, dude, I mean, honestly, if I can't get 170, then I'm just going to talk to a real estate agent. I'll, I'll, I'll point them in that direction. I'll say, okay, hey, makes complete sense. Yeah, I think that we're probably not a good fit for you. Um, I think we're going to, you know, we'll be able to pay more than other investors would. But at the, at the end of the day, I think we're just too far away. Um, so I think you should probably listen with a real estate agent. Are you currently working with somebody? And then I'm going to try to push them to our real estate agent and get a 30% referral because I have my license. So that's what I would do if they're still unreasonable on their asking price when I actually get the price out of them. If, it, if we're not even in the range, I'm going to still continue to disqualify them until I can make sure that, yep, there's no way this is a deal. And at that point, if they say, no, I you know don't want to list with a real estate agent and stuff, I'm going to sell it to cash. I would then just put them on a drip and then follow up with them later and just say, hey, look, I'll, I'll work up a, an offer or something like that. But we're, we're pretty far away and I don't want to offend you or anything like that. And then I would just put them on a drip and follow up with them. You'd be surprised how many people do come back afterwards. So, all right. So hopefully that generates some questions. I know I went over a lot, but I'll take some questions or anything if you guys have anything. So Dakota, my question to you is the the number that you're giving hey this is what other investors would offer i think that's brilliant by the way so just like you're setting a low anchor price just just for that purpose right and if they if they go for it then you're like okay you know we'll we'll you know we'll just come out and have a look at the property exactly yep so it's a low anchor price and if they said yeah, honestly, I think that'd be in the range. I'd be like, okay, perfect. Well, what we're going to do next is like, I would either, it depends on what kind of, you know, process you have. I would then send a purchase agreement over and say, okay, well, um, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and send you over a, uh, a document. We can go over it and everything. And uh, it's just going to be contingent on walking through it. So other than that, just verifying the condition is everything that you said it was and basically get a purchase agreement from there and then just be it contingent on walking through the thing. Got it. And I have one other question. When you go over the two options with the sellers and you ask them which one do they prefer, then your next question is, why do you feel that? I'm curious, like what sort of responses do you get? I mean, if I was talking to someone that would really put me off guard, I'm like, oh, holy crap, I wasn't ready for this question. So does that catch people off guard when you ask them that question? No, because the funniest part is you've already given the answer in the past one. So I'll show you this really quick. And then we can role play it out if you want, because it's it's crazy how it does feel weird whenever you're going to ask it. And then whenever you do, like you already told them everything. So I'll use it in the same example that we were. So, um, you know, typically to get the most money, you're going to want to clean it up, make sure it's vacant, get professional photos, realtor fees. You're going to have realtor fees, appraisal inspections for the simplest process. Um, that would be like more something that we can help with. It's going to be cash, which means that it's as is. There's no realtor fees or commissions, no appraisals no inspections and you can take or leave whatever you want. And we're really flexible on the closing time and whatever works best for you. We also buy it with tenants in there and we can take over their lease. And again, we cover all the closing costs out of those two options. Which one sounds more like what you're looking for? Um, yeah, I think the simplest process. Okay. And, and why do you feel that way though? And then what are they going to do? They're going to pinpoint out of these things that I just said, they're going to pinpoint which ones make the most sense for them. Well, you said that, you know, you're going to take over the tenants and I really didn't want to kick them out. And then you said that you buy it as is. And honestly, I haven't been in there in years, so I don't know what the condition is. They're going to, you already gave them the answer. They're just going to pinpoint exactly what it is. And they basically just answer it. I've never had anybody not answer the question. Actually, they answer it and they're like, they pick whatever uh, they liked the most out of the options that we gave them. Oh, I think that's a fantastic idea. And then you're just using that moving forward. Like anytime just they have an objection, you go back to that at that point. Hey, you mentioned that you want to sell your property as is. You haven't been in the property for years and then you have tenants uh, and then you don't want to kick them out. Exactly. Yeah. So if they say that they want a higher price, let's say that they're they're a little bit out of range. Then I say, well, hey, remember when I asked you about, you know, highest price versus the simplest process? You said you wanted more of the simplest process because you didn't want to kick them out. And because of that, uh, you know, the repairs and stuff. Well, this is the option that I'm able to give you. If you want to get more for it, that's definitely an option for you. I think you just have to move the tenant out. I, I let them like I give space to let them make the decision. I'm just basically helping them to make the decision. Like which one's more important to you? And I'll, I'll straight up ask them that. Which one's more important? Sometimes they're like, at that point, whenever they know it's going to cost money, they're like, okay, you can kick the tenant out. 
okay, so now I don't have to take over the lease. They're, they're on a month to month lease. Are you okay with me getting them out of there? Because another thing that I like to do is run stuff off of a flip and then run it off of a rental. So I usually explain that to them. Hey, I'm running this as a rental because you want me to take over the lease. And so I'm running this as a rental rate. So that's why I'm offering you what I'm offering. Like, well, my house is worth way more than that. I completely understand. And I agree with you. I'm running it based on a rental portfolio because you said you wanted me to keep the, keep the tenants in there. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, actually, I don't care if you keep them in there anymore. I'm like, okay, so that's not as important. And you're okay. Because I do like to honor what I tell to a seller. If we tell them we're going to keep the tenants in there, I don't want to kick a tenant out. So we use that kind of stuff to like really find out what they want. No, that sounds great, man. All right. Who else has a question for Dakota that you want to ask about sales? I got a question for you. That's right. Hey, Dakota, thanks for this. Um, I missed the the very beginning. Um, so I don't know if that, that sheet you have is going to be made available. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll, let me send it again oh, for you. I appreciate it. Um, so my, my question is... Um, kind of along what you just said with, with um, if you got somebody with tenants in the place, like here's a scenario that I'm talking to a guy right now. He's got four properties that he wants to offload, right? Two of them have tenants in them. One of them goes for another year till January. One of them goes till August. And the other two are, are either month to month or nobody's in that. Is that something like, are you trying to lock down all four of them and you think you can easily find buyers that are willing to take something that has a lease, um, that they're willing to just hold it for a year? Or are you going to say like, uh, you know, we're really not interested in those other two, but let's just take these these two that um, you know nobody's in, and your offer goes that route. Like, what's what's your approach with that? Like, how easy is it to find buyers that that want to buy occupied rentals with long leases and versus ones that are ready to go? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's going to depend a lot on your exit strategy. So, are you are you in a financial position that you would be okay with keeping them? I guess is my first question. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily um, want to hold those for a year. Okay. Yeah. So I look at things a lot of different ways. So one is I'm going to run it as if I'm going to keep it because whenever we're wholesaling, like we're, we're, we wholesale probably about 80% of our properties, but we're not really wholesalers because I'm willing to close on it. I'm willing to flip it. We're willing to keep it as a rental, no matter what, we're going to honor what we say we're going to do, which is why I feel like we've got the reputation we have. And like, we're one of the biggest buyers in Fort Wayne. So what I would say is run it as if worst case scenario, you have to keep it that way. You're like, dude, and then no matter what, you're going to be okay because it's going to be so cheap probably because you really don't want it. So you kind of run it backwards like that. You just say, Hey, look, I'm going to run this as if I really don't want to keep it. But if I had to, at the end of the day, I'll be okay. And then 90% of the time you can then wholesale it because you're buying it and you don't really want it. You're going to find somebody else that actually does want it in that area and is okay with somebody keeping it as a rental. So that's usually the way that I run stuff like that. If it's in a new market, I'm like, dang, I really don't want a rental in that market. I really don't want it. I'm going to run the numbers backwards. Uh, so let's just say it's a thousand dollars gross rent. I'll, I'll put a max offer of $70,000 on that thing because I know that somebody else will buy that thing for 75 to $80,000 if it's in halfway decent shape, because most people can't find deals like that. So if you really don't want to keep it, just run it so conservative that you know that you'll be able to sell it to another investor, maybe even sight unseen. So that's what I would suggest if you're wholesaling and, and they're going to be on a long-term lease. Dakota, I have a quick question yeah. for you. I actually have two questions, by the way. So first is just about the process, right? So I have a lead manager and acquisition manager scenario, right? My pipeline for active leads is built as new leads, no contact made, prospecting to where the lead manager sees if the lead is qualified and then gives it to the acquisition manager. But just in the concept of a report, you know, it, it goes from cold caller lead manager to acquisition manager. So what should the lead manager be doing to where it's not conflicting with the acquisition manager's true report to qualify the lead? Like the four pillars are going to come from the acquisition manager, right? Not the lead manager. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand completely well what you're saying. That's been a it's been a tough thing actually for us because I do feel like it goes when it goes from cold call to another person to another person, it gets mm -hmm. it gets very difficult because the closer, in order to actually close a deal, has to have a lot of rapport already built exactly. because they're trying to ask them to move forward with it. And the way that you build rapport is by asking the questions that actually help build it. So yeah, that's a tough one. Um, we've still been working through that. And honestly, I'd have to ask our acquisitions guy exactly where they stopped. What I would say is like get a general idea on the condition. And then what I usually do when I come in as the closer, because I do sometimes for the acquisitions managers, I go through and I verify 
everything that they said. That way they're not repeating themselves because we all know that we've been on the freaking credit cards and you repeat yourself seven times. You keep getting passed through and it really pisses you off. We don't want to be like that. We want to say, hey, I know that you talked to a couple different people. Here's the information I got so far. Does that all sound accurate? Okay. Is there anything else that you can think of? Like build as much rapport as you can with them as the, as the closer. And then like, you know, just take all the notes and build rapport wherever you can is what I would say as the closer. But it's so difficult because I think that if the, if the person beforehand can close and they're asking closing questions, the person's giving them more information. It's almost like, it's like they're kind of stopping themselves from actually building more. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. Be like, yeah, question. I'm not going to ask this. Yeah. Because like, I know that's the next person. So that's been a tough transition for us and a tough thing to do, but I would say have them uh, closer, just go and build rapport, repeat as much as they possibly know already and ask if there's anything else that they can think of that would help them make good decisions. Yeah. My second question was just uh, about your input on a deal. Actually, I'm in the Georgia market. I got, I came across this deal in Alabama land. Uh, Utilities are all on. It's fully leveled and ready to go. 7.1 acres, mobile home, 30,000 for it. It's worth like way, way, way more than that. So when you get to a concept of that and we're trying to take it in house, it's like, what would you do in that concept? Because it's mobile home zoned already. Um, So what are you asking exactly? Like to take it down in house, that specific deal, you know, for getting like cash flow, revenue, and all that other type of stuff. Like you got to go down there and get permits and just check everything out first, right? Yeah, that's so you can always make it contingent on that stuff too. That's what I always do is like, dude, I like to lock stuff up before you do a lot of due diligence and make it contingent on it because then it makes sense for everybody and then you're not wasting your time. So if you're ever going to do anything where you have to spend money, then just put it under contract and say, hey, it's going to be contingent on these things. And then you know, if those things all work out, then bam, dude, you're freaking happy with it because those problems were solved. 100%. Okay. Yeah. And then if you don't want to, like, I don't know, I really, I don't love like developing in different areas. Everybody's different though. I mean, I know a lot of people that do it virtually, but uh, for me, I'm always just like, yeah, let me just wholesale the thing. But at the same time, like make sure you get under contract for those contingencies, because let's say it's a piece of crap piece of land and you can't actually do anything with it and you don't know it. And then you get under contract. You're like, Oh dang, that kind of sucks. So Mm -hmm. I'd rather like have that contingency on there. And then you got to contract and then you could always wholesale it. Or if you want to develop it because it's the perfect piece of land, develop it, or you can just buy and list it. Like you have a lot more options if you have it under contract with contingencies. Mm -hmm. 100%. Okay. Hey, I have a question. Yeah. So your goal is to pretty much get it locked up at, on the phone and then make everything contingent on when you get boots on the ground to make sure everything checks out, correct? Right? Yes. Now let me verify this though, because I don't have the same concept as uh, RJ Bates. If you guys watch him at all, he just says lock everything up, no matter what the pricing is. I disagree with that completely. If they're asking retail, I'm not going to waste my time, dude. Like, uh, so only if I think we're actually in the range, that's it. If I, if, if they're asking retail and I don't think it's actually a deal, I don't want to waste their time and I don't want to waste my time, dude. I don't want to do that to people. So only if I think, Hey, sounds to me like we're in the ballpark. Now, if it's like a 10 grand deal and my minimum is 20, I'm going to go take a look at it because the next thing that I say is very true too. Hey, sounds to me like we're at least in the range. It's really going to come down to the exact amount of repairs that are needed. So let me come out there, take a look at it and see exactly what repairs are going to be there. So I can get you a, a, a solid offer instead of a ballpark. Does that make sense? And they're like, yeah, that makes sense. So then we'll go out there and then our chances go up because we actually know that we're close to a deal. Like we're really close. And then now we can tell them, hey, I know you said that it only needed this and this, but actually I see this, this, and this. And so for that reason, I need to offer this price. And that's how we lock up a lot of deals. So I just want to make sure I clarify that. Yes, we lock them up over the phone and that's the goal, but we don't want to do it with just everything. They're like, yeah, I want 200K and the ARV is 200. I'm not going to lock it up. It's just a waste of time, in my opinion. (laughs) No, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, so it comes with the skill of underwriting directly on the phone. And being exactly. quick on your toes and making sure that you do it. Okay. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of people have, or what I used to have struggle as well is, I mean, for me, at least in the smaller market, I'm, I, I live in Emerald, Texas here. So it's a smaller market, you know, it's not like, you know, DFW area, anything like that. So, I mean, I've been accustomed to going and, you know, just go look at the house real quick down the street. You know what I mean? Or yeah, it's not, it's like a 20 minute drive. So me leaning more to the concept of, 
getting to other markets outside of where I'm at. It's just kind of like I can make that two hour drive to go check out the property, but I'd rather not. So it's yeah. just the skill of underwriting and making sure. Okay, I got you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I want to say something real quick on that because you pointed out two things that I really like, actually. So one is underwriting on the phone. That's so important, dude. So the way that you underwrite on the phone, though, is by taking this script and mastering the script. Um, so I'm going to do a little plug here. I do sales training on Mondays. Uh, uh, it's 250 bucks a month, very cheap. Um, and then we actually go and role play this stuff. But the goal is for you guys to have this be embedded in your subconscious to where you're not like, okay, what do I say next? Oh, what question do I need to ask? What do I need? No, your goal should be listening to what they're saying, writing stuff down and underwriting all at the same time. The only way you can do that is if you have that script so memorized, so like in your subconscious that it just automatically flows. And that way you can be focused on the other stuff to see, even see if it makes sense for you guys. Um, so yeah, the other thing that I will say is to go on every appointment in the beginning, because when you go on an appointment, it's going to build up uh, confidence talking to people. It's going to build up your experience. And then also every time that you actually go out to an appointment, your odds of actually closing that deal go up that much more. So you are more likely to close a deal in person than you are over the phone because you have more rapport. But you will waste a lot of time because even if you get in person with some people, they're not going to go down $100,000 if they want retail. But you will get more experience. So I just uh, want to at least clarify that. The reason of why we don't now is because we have so many leads and not enough time to go to all the appointments. So we don't waste our time on stuff like that. But in the beginning, I say go on every single one of them because you're going to build experience. You're going to build your underwriting. You're going to know what to look for. It just it just makes more sense to go on every appointment only in the beginning. But when you get so many leads that you're like, you're like, dude, I can't go to them all anymore. Then you need to change your change the way you do it. Hey, to go oh, that before awesome. we move forward, I know you have the sales training. Do you want to put some more information if someone wants to work with you? Uh, yeah, yeah what's the best way to do that yeah i was gonna ask too um yeah i'll just actually just put an email i do have a website but um i'll just have you guys just email me if you guys want to work with me uh, do you uh, Koda, do you do any full wholesale or jv any chance by that say that again you uh do any type of co-wholesaling or joint venture jvs um, yeah, we will. So, uh, we just got a new dispositions guy and then we got, um, oh, what's that called? Investor lift on like cartel or whatever. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're open into helping people dispo and stuff. And I love closing deals. So if you need, if you got a tough one and you want somebody to close a deal, that's where I love to do it. Other than that, I pass you on to the team and then we kind of work together for dispositions and stuff like that. So yeah, that is something I've done in the past. I've also done transaction coordinating for a guy because he didn't know how to do all the paperwork. So I basically helped him with all the paperwork in order to get the deal to close. That was funny too. You structure all of that in Are You Simply? The cold sailing, JV, all of that, everything? No, I wish. I have not figured it out. We use Are You Simply for like automatic follow-ups, drips, and uh, basically the CRM. The rest of it, honestly, I've not gotten a chance to because it's mostly the team that does all this stuff now. Like I really am like overseeing it all now and restructuring the business. I really don't do a lot of like systems operations and day-to-day -day stuff. Gotcha. We do, we do, by the way, have an update coming in Q2 uh, to just make it very, very transaction coordinator friendly. So like just to completely change the DC process. So we are, we're working on that. That should be coming with some other cool updates, depending on what kind of deals you're doing, you'll be able to manage all of that within recently. That's awesome. That's exciting. All right. Yeah. All right. So Wontavius has a question like uh, it's a little bit similar to the last question. When uh, when you're buying property sight unseen, let's say if you do not have the option of actually going and looking at the property, you're buying it out of state, you don't have any boots on the ground. How do you go about making an offer that you feel confident with? Uh, that's so just, just, to, just to be clear, in your market, every single property, you make an offer, you underwrite in your market, then you actually go look at it or someone on your team goes and looks at it, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, we bought some without seeing them too. Yeah, I mean, but but the, your process is typically to go look at it. But let's say if you're buying in a market where you did not have the option, you just you know had to make an offer, how would you go about doing that? I'm going to answer that in a couple of different ways because one, I believe that everybody can go see it in some way. You can find somebody to take photos. Like you can find somebody down in that area to go and look at it for you. But let's just say hypothetically, it's very difficult to get into. They don't want you to see the inside, which we have happened a lot too. And it's a new market and you don't know, which I'm in now too, because Taras and I, like I said, we're starting a, a business down here in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Um, and we just started wholesaling and we don't know anything, dude. Like I'm 
I'm running ARVs. I don't have MLS access. So if you guys have MLS access, want to help me out, let me know. So it's hard for me to like figure out what are these properties worth? So what I would say is make sure that you go based on what you can find, obviously, like as much information as you can get. So tax information, you're going to look up Zillow, Realtor, all of that stuff. Get the best idea. Look at comps. Like, dude, we run comps on Zillow. I know it's not the best place, but sometimes you have to just use what you got. Get the best idea that you possibly can. And then be conservative on your numbers. The other thing that I would say is make sure you have a contingency in there to where it's contingent on something. So you can say, because like the, the thing that I don't like about what wholesalers do is sometimes they will make offers. They'll tell somebody they're really confident on it. And then the person gets all ready to move out. And then the person's screwed because you don't have the money to close on it because you couldn't find an end buyer because you locked it up for too much. So if you just let them know, hey, I'm actually not in the state right now. Or like, hey, I don't have, I'm actually not in the area. So I'm just going to have to make this uh, contingent on partner approval. Um, so I'll have him do the underwriting and stuff like that. Let me get some more information. Then maybe you go and find somebody in that area to JV with or something. But I would have a contingency in there, whatever that contingency is, in order to make sure that they know that you're not going to close it until that contingency is met. So they don't start making decisions and you have a way out, then you can still keep your word. So the way that I usually do that too, is by negotiating. I give them a price that's so low that if they say, yes, I'm going to find a way to make it work no matter what. Most of the time, they're just going to say no to that. So then they're going to ask you to counter. And then what you can say is, okay, man, that's a really big stretch for me. Honestly, it seems kind of like a risk. If I go up to that, would you be willing to give me two weeks in order to have my partner underwrite this? Most of the time at that point, now they're going to say yes, because they're asking you to do more and you're telling them how conservative you are. And so you're asking for something else. It's a thing that we do as humans is like reciprocation. It's very normal. And so most of the time they're like, yeah, as long as you give me the price, I'm cool with that. Now you have a way out. So that's usually when I throw it in there. I throw in a crazy low ball that no matter what, I'm going to find a way to wholesale this thing and move it. If they say no and they give me a counter, then I ask for the contingency there to make sure that I'm protecting myself. Would you consider if in new market, maybe like co-wholesaling, like find out another buyer in your market and say, hey, I'm going to lock this deal up. Do you want to partner up on it? Or other other investors have heard this, like have an agent go out and look at the property and pay them like hundred bucks or something. 100%. Yeah, that's a great way to do it too, agents. Main thing is make sure you have it under contract because I hear a lot of people getting deals snaked from them, yeah, especially yeah. when you're outside of the market. So just make sure you got a contract. Absolutely. Cool. Dakota, yeah. I had a little follow-up on what you, what you just said. Um, you, you, yeah. you caught me when you said uh, the tax info. So when I'm under when I'm underwriting and looking up stuff, I'm typically I'm going on PropStream, finding comps there. I'm also going on Zillow, finding comps there. Um, finding rental comps, for sale comps, all of those things to try to see if everything averages out. But what I'm seeing on Prop Street a lot is like at, at the bottom of a of a detailed uh, page, it always has the tax assessment information. Um, are, are, you're probably familiar with that, but if you're if you're not, or if anybody else isn't, like I find that number always way off from the prop stream estimated value and the rest of them. Like, how well do you take that into consideration? Sometimes it's half the value or less. Sometimes it's a little bit more. Like specifically, I had one for the, the props from yesterday. It was like 200K and tax assessed is 140. Another property is like one, 140, but tax assessed is 74. So that one was exactly 50% about. So how do, you, how do you take that in consideration of your offer? Well, knowing that, so let's just say that's the only information that we have, right? I couldn't find any comps. I don't know what it's worth. And I just look at the tax assess. If I use that as my ARV and I work the numbers from there, I know I'm going to get a good deal. You know what I mean? Hypothetically, I should be, right? So that's how I kind of look at it. And I also look at it like maybe that's the only number that they've ever seen. And you could start off with that. Hey, looks like your tax assess is right around here. Um, you know, and just say something like that. Like your tax assess is around here. And then you said it needs some repairs. I mean, it looks like other investors and you could use that um, as a, a anchor number and then subtract out any repairs that they said. So I like to use that number to my advantage on either worst case ARV or like the only number that they might even be thinking of whenever they see it, because a lot of people bring it up. Now, one thing that I do want to say there, too, is I will also use that as negotiation if somebody's like, hey, well, my, my tax assess work says it's worth 200,000 and usually they're low. So I think my property is worth 260. It's funny that 
it's kind of like depending on who you're talking to, how you're going to frame something, right? It's all it's all the way you look at it. I'm just like, hey, well, the tax guy always wants your taxes to be as high as possible, right? So they seems like they go up every year and they're going to continue to raise them. And they're like, yeah, they do. It's like, yeah, so they're going to continue to raise that whether your house value goes up or not, it seems like. And so I just kind of like reframe it in their mind to where now they're devaluing that as a uh, authority. And sometimes I use that as an authority, depending on which leverage works out best for our situation, I guess, if that makes sense. Cool. No, that does help. But you, you wouldn't you wouldn't consider it for your purpose. You wouldn't consider a tax assessment as, as ARV, right? That's, that's more of like an as is condition if, if, at best um yes so like i said if i had no other information i know worst case scenario that it's going to be worth more than that so if i wanted worst worst case then i would use that number and then i would know I that gotcha. would be completely and, safe you, and yeah, one well, the, yeah okay cool one other thing i would do is like check the local area like for us i buy properties in northwest indiana so they update their tax values every year and it's pretty close to the market value, maybe like 10, 15% off. But I live in California. They don't update it every year. I think it's based on like whatever I paid for the property. That's my tax. My tax assets value will be that until when I sell the property. So just keep that in mind. I would look into the local area, how the how they come up with the tax assessed value. Sometimes it's based on whatever the owner paid for it or when they bought it, what the value of the property was at that point. Yep. That's yeah. great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think of that. I'm going to share with you guys one other thing really quick, because this has been super helpful for us. Um, so this is like our max offer sheet. So basically, this is what we do. We, we you know, I'm, I'm not going to go over all these numbers because this is like your guys' numbers for whenever you're actually running it. But something that we do uh, with ours, is like we go to the Zillow, Zillow website, we put in two comps. This is what I require for our acquisitions managers before they send it over to me because I'm doing all the underwriting now. Um, and then I want to know, like, you know, do you happen to know how old the roof is, if what kind of furnace it is, if it has central AC, if it's on a well and septic foundation on a scale of one to 10. Again, this is over the phone. And then we can also put this in. And then if it's different in person, then we can let them know that this is internal questions because we should be able to figure this out ourselves. Um, this is our legend. You can make this for yourself or make it for them. Um, but it's just easier to explain your offer to somebody whenever you have the, the criteria. But anyway, this is mainly what I want to show you guys. It makes life a lot simpler. If you're in a lot of different counties, dude, figuring out all the different county websites and finding them all sometimes gets really freaking annoying. And so like Adams County, I don't know if any of you guys invest in Adams County in Indiana, very difficult to get to. So you got to click this one first, then you got to get the parcel number. Then you got to take the parcel number going to this one and like, dude, it's a mess. But now we have these here every time. So we don't have to go click through a bunch of them. So if you ever want to find one, we literally just click it. And then like, you know, I'll show you guys my personal house. You can literally just type it in and then it, it'll pull straight up. And then it makes your life easier. So anything that you can do to make your life faster, then um, you can go and do more deals, so underwrite more that way. So that's what I would uh, suggest is like saving all of this stuff in one and making it as fast and simple of a process as you can, because again, you're going to probably be doing this over the phone. So you want it to be as fast as possible. Are you doing that to see if they're behind on taxes or any other in information you can find on the owner? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking to see what they bought it for. That helps a lot because if you can know what they bought it for like 10 years ago, sometimes people just want a little bit more. And sometimes I'll start my offer five grand above what they paid for it. And that's a really good spot. So I'll see what they paid for it. I'm also looking to see if it's a manufactured home. I'm looking to see sometimes the uh, Zillow says it's 1200 square foot, but actually it's 2,500 square foot. It's just the upstairs was an attic that wasn't finished at one point. And then now there's actually more square footage. So I use it just to verify a lot of information and find out as much as I possibly can. Eric, this has been awesome. Uh, so um, do you, I, I guess, you know, based on your questions, you know, do you, would you like the simplest option or would you like the, the most money? It sounds like you're using creative finance. Um, could you kind of talk to talk about how you kind of walk the seller through that if they have questions? Yeah, so I'm not using seller finance. I've done seller finance like uh, two or three times and uh, that was more for like a short-term flip. So mm -hmm. yeah, I guess like if you if you maybe clarify your question, I'll be able to answer it more. No, no, that is the question. So you do run it as a flip, you run it as a uh, rental. So you're, 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 you're bringing your own financing, uh, maybe hard money or something like that to make the, the numbers work. So that, that, well, that does. Yeah, or wholesaling it. I mean, when I say simplest process or the most money, 
So when they say they want the most money, most of the time that means they're going to list it on the market with a real estate agent, because that's my opinion, the way to get the most money, right? Absolutely. If you want to sell it cash as is and like be done with it and go through the fast process, that's where we come into play and I can give them a good offer. They're going to give up equity for speed and convenience is basically the way I explain it. You're going to give up this money for speed and convenience. But if you want to get the most, go through this route and list it with an agent. And then you're going to get somebody who wants to live there. And anybody who wants to live there should hypothetically pay more money than what an investor is going to. That's kind of the way that I explain it to them. Gotcha. Do you have a template by any chance of that sheet that you showed us? Um, I do. Let me see. Let me see if I got one, Max. That was really nice. Like they could just ask the questions while having that sheet pulled up the entire time while being on the phone with them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really smart thing to have the, the county information there because sometimes, you know, it's hard to know if they're behind on taxes or whatnot. You could just go to the assessor website and then find out, oh, you're actually behind. You haven't paid your taxes for like last three installments or whatnot. And you get some insight on that. It could just be like a tax lien situation right there. Yeah. But depending on, I think, where we buy, if they miss three tax payments, that's when it like, it goes on to the tax auction, but if they miss like two, I don't think it does. Um, so yeah, I mean, but if they miss two, you know, they have some issues going on, some financial distress going on at that point, you know, you could use that as negotiating. But even if they miss three and it goes to the tax sale auction, they still have like a- Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah exactly. Oh yeah, even after, even if it sells for tax auction in Indiana where I buy, they can still redeem it for a year. It's it's like crazy. Yeah. Cool. All right. Dakota shared something in the chat. Yep. So I gave uh I gave you guys that document that has all those. So I, if you're not in Indiana, obviously delete out all that county website and stuff and then update it with your guys's. I made one for Florida as well, just for the counties that we're currently buying in. Again, just to make it way faster and simpler for you guys. Um, I would do that on every county that you invest in. Cool. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for sharing. And guys, Dakota also shared his email address. And, you know, of course, you've seen how much value he shared. I'm going to just put that again. If you want to connect with him, work with him. Um, Dakota, you said you do weekly calls, right? Every Monday? Yep. Weekly calls yeah. every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern right. Standard Time. Yep. And people can jump on, ask any questions that they have, and then you can just like help them with the specific scenarios. Yep. So that one's, uh, it's more for our acquisitions guys and sales training specifically. I'll answer any questions usually on them as well, but we go through role-playing, we go through the script. We actually listen to live calls from our acquisitions guys. We'll listen to live calls from yours and then basically give some feedback. I'll do live cold calling on there. I actually will, uh, I'll call your lead sometimes too, if you need help closing, like whatever we can do to teach sales in general, that's what I focus on on Mondays because I'm training our acquisitions guys then. That's over Zoom as well. So it's a Zoom call. So just shoot me over an email if you guys are interested. Also, my name is my Instagram name too. So if you guys want to follow me on Instagram, I post a lot of different content. I do live cold calling and stuff on there too. So you guys can like see different different calls. It's kind of fun. I, I also call people a lot and tell them I love them if, they, if they're not a deal. Like, I love you and just see how they react. It's kind of fun. <laughs> that is so awesome, man. Cool, Dakota. Dude, this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much again, you know, coming on this call and sharing, you know, your wealth of information. I think like everybody on this call is going to agree they they got a ton. And then we'll email, we'll send your email address out to uh, anybody on our email list just to see if they want to connect with you more and, you know, get some more information. I really? like it, man. And then, yeah, I know next time we talked about having my business partner, Tony on. Yeah. He's like the a big marketing guy and stuff. So hopefully be fantastic. We'll back and yeah, go over that yeah. stuff. Dakota, real quick before you go for the sheet that you just sent us, um, yeah. each property that you do an offer on, like it should just be like opening up a new tab for it. You know what I mean? Because you want the formulas to stay and everything like that, right? Yep. Yep. So what I do is I, uh, I, I'll show you guys this really fast. So basically what I do is I'll just literally go here, go to file and I'll make a copy and then I'll type the address in. So I have that saved for each address. So like, let's just say 25, 22, Main Street. So then now it pulls up and then I go to Main Street and then now I have that one. This is the link to the in photos person. The data was taken that way. Like if I need to go and underwrite it, then I have photos. I know what date it was. I have the comps. I got everything I need in order to underwrite this thing. Also, this is for customer use because sometimes I'll ask them, hey, how much do you think it's worth? Okay, how much repairs do you think it is? Our realtor fees are six, but internally I can get it at 3.5 because I have an agent on the team that does it for 1% and I offer two and a half to the other side. 
But to them, I'm going to explain to them that most people will pay 6%. So I have numbers that they will make sense to them. And then I have internal numbers that's worst case in numbers. So that's why both of those are there as well. I appreciate that. Great idea. Hey, thank you, Dakota. Dude, it's been a great call, man. Awesome. Yeah, I'm thank happy you. to like, provide any value. Thank you for having me on, man. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for jumping on the call, man. Yep. Thank you, guys. All right. See you guys next week. Thanks. Thanks.